think about how you got here. Odds are you had a good start. Family, guidance, chances to fail and overcome. ROCA gives that kind of support to the highest risk young people. The 17 to 24 year olds in gangs or in jail who keep the police busy, who need change but aren't ready yet. Take Andre, he just got out of jail. A ROCA youth worker, Eric, knocks on his door. At first, Andre is like, <laughs> yeah, right. But Roka's relentless. Eric never stops reaching out. Eventually, Andre begins to trust Eric and comes to Roka. He gets a job on our work cruise, takes high school classes, and learns critical work and life skills. Then, once again, Andre slips. He stops coming. He gets fired. He avoids Roka and gets in trouble. But Roka's ready. We know setbacks are part of the process. Eric stays on Andre and keeps bringing him back until Andre learns he can stumble, recover, and keep going. Eric works with Andre's probation officer and the police. Together, they support and push Andre, helping him move forward. After four years with Roca, Andre knows how to work. He has goals and the tools to make it. Working in the streets for three decades, Roca has helped thousands of young people change their lives. For them, we have to improve every day. So we track and analyze everything. Every knock on a door, every class, every failure, and accomplishment. Data keeps us accountable. Data proves Roca works. Take a look. Our continued success depends on you. Support Roca so we can help more young people prove that change is possible. Good morning, gentlemen. All righty. Um, it is my distinct pleasure to introduce uh, Miss Molly Baldwin today. Um, Ms. Baldwin founded uh, ROCA in 1988 and serves as the organization's chief executive officer with a mission to disrupt the cycle of poverty and incarceration by helping young people transform their lives. Um, ROCA serves over 900 high-risk high youth annually across 21 communities in Massachusetts. For three decades, Ms. Baldwin has been a tireless advocate, mentor, and community convener, reaching out to the highest risk young people and bringing together uh, the major institutions, corporations, and agencies that affect their lives. Uh, today, we're going to actually be hearing about Roca Baltimore, which is a behavior change program uh, geared towards to, uh, young men ages 16 to 24 that are at the highest risk of uh, being involved in gun violence. Please welcome uh, Ms. Baldwin and representatives of Roca Baltimore. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for giving us a few minutes. I promise I won't talk long. I'm an old lady. You don't care what I have to say. I will say three things. One is I grew up in Baltimore. Really, really honored to be here with you all. Two is I'm very old and my dad is really, really old and he went to Gilman and he would love to be here with you today, but is not able to. And most of all, I'm so honored to introduce you to my two dear friends and colleagues, Kurt and Jamal, who lead Roca Baltimore. They'll talk a little bit about what they what we do and they'll ask you all some questions. So thank you for giving us a few minutes this morning. Thank you. Good morning. morning. Y'all know it's Friday, right? That's the best you got? Good morning. Good morning. There we go. So my name is Kurt Palermo. I'm the vice president of Roca Maryland. I appreciate you all inviting us to come and present a little bit about Roca and what we do. I'm just going to go over the model a little bit, ask some questions, and then Jamal is going to kind of really get into to how the work looks in Baltimore and, and how we work with this very uh, special group of young men. So as mentioned, ROCA works with young men who are at the highest risk of gun violence. Their likely outcome, if they continue to do what they've been doing, is to end up in jail or worse. And we've seen that in Massachusetts, and we've seen it in Baltimore since coming here in 2018. Our young men have previous incarceration, supervision, whether it's juvenile or adult. Some have been shot and some have shot people. But these young men can change. They can do something different. And we've seen that. And they deserve the opportunity to not end up in jail or dead. They deserve the opportunity 
to do whatever they want in their lives and not remain in harm's way. And that's what we do. We go find young men who do not want to engage with us. They don't want to be in a program. They tell us, stop coming to my house, stop knocking on my door, don't call me. And guess what? We go back because they're worth it. We love them and this is privileged work. So as you can see, again, boring statistic slides. You probably don't want to see it, but gang involved, street involved, arrests, probation, incarceration, that's who we work with. If these young men could go to another program, they don't belong at ROCA. If they can show up consistently, we don't want them. We'll put a bow on them and we'll walk them to the door of the program that can support them, right? And how we do that is through brain science and CBT, which is cognitive behavioral theory. So I'm not the smartest person in the world, but we're gonna go over this, talk about the brain science, and I'm gonna ask you some questions and kind of talk to you about how CBT works in real life. If you think about your brain, right? It tells you what to do. It's how you function. Our young men have been so traumatized that they're living in the bottom brain, survival mode, right? If you're trying to survive, you're trying to keep yourself alive and out of harm's way. So the young men we work with feel scared, anxious, nervous, and they genuinely think everyone and everything is out to get them and do them harm. Because of that, they react. Fight, flight, or freeze. You may have heard that. In those situations, when you feel cornered and you feel like there's no other option, you're either gonna fight flight or freeze. Our young men genuinely fight. They might have a weapon they can pull that weapon out and choose to use it. Or they freeze and they're the victim of gun violence. So through cognitive behavioral theory, we're able to teach them these critical life-saving skills so that they can do something different. Take an eight to 10 second pause before they act, right? How many of you like going to school? Raise your hand. Right? Keep your hand up if you value your education, right? Keep your hand up if you've ever not wanted to do your homework. You're not gonna get in trouble, you can leave your hands up, it's fine. <laughs> All right, so you're telling me you value your education and sometimes you don't wanna do your homework. Raise your hand if you've not done your homework and gone to school. A few of you, right? It's fine. You're telling me you value your education but the behavior of not doing your homework isn't in line with valuing your education. Because if you don't do your homework, what could happen? Anyone? Get in trouble, get a bad grade, fail a test. Our young men tell us they value their life, their freedom, their children, but then when Jamal goes to see them and they're standing on the corner and they have a gun on them, is that behavior in line with being free? Because if they got caught with the gun, they're gonna to go to jail. If they pull the gun out, they might get hurt, right? So we're talking about homework and going to school. These young men find themselves in situations where they need that eight to 10 second pause. They need to learn these skills so that they're not reacting. They're being intentional about their decision-making, right? And that's who we're working with. And we work with them for a very long time. Some of the guys never leave and we love them and they come back but it takes time. We're not with them for a week, two weeks. We're with them for two, three, four years because that's how long it takes for them to learn and use these new behaviors, right? So Jamal, who is our assistant director of youth work, oversees the entire outreach team. These individuals are going out, they're knocking on doors, they're in cars, they're picking guys up, they're bringing them to the building, building relationships, getting to know everything about these young men so that we can push them to do something different. So he's gonna talk about outreach and all the fun stuff. Sorry, I bored you with the brain science. Without further ado, Jamal West. Morning, everybody. Um, let's talk a little bit about myself first, and then I dive into the outreach because my life's experiences are what helped me be good at doing outreach. I'm a Baltimore City resident, went to Poly, made some wrong decisions, and I ended up in prison for over seven and a half years. I came home, I became a mentor and a hall monitor at, started at Carver, worked at Digital, worked at Merville High School, where I encountered some young men that are from the same neighborhoods where I grew up in, and I seen that I could affect change on a small level. Roka had provided me the opportunity to be more one-on-one -on -one with these guys. It's easy for me to get somebody that's hanging in the hallway to walk them back to class. 
how easy is it for me to get them to stay out of prison? That's where Roka comes in line and where Relentless Outreach helped me be more personable with these young men. Outreach is not easy. It has its days, has a lot of bad days, meaning the trust level is different. Piggybacking off of what Kurt just said about fight, flight, or freeze, I could tell you my first day out doing outreach, I go to knock on the door, boom, 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 boom. Boom, 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 boom. Someone comes and peeks out of the, cur out of the curtain. The mom comes to the door, I ask for the young man. When I ask for the young man, mom opens the door wide open, he's running out the back door thinking that I'm law enforcement, which I'm not. I'm here to help with behavior change. I'm gonna keep saying the word change because if I could do it, these same young men in this program definitely can. They just need the opportunity. And this is where Roka is opportunity meets resistance because these guys definitely have trust levels that's really low. So this same young man that ran out of that back door the first time I met him, end up becoming what I call one of my family members. Because through time, presenting that opportunity and helping him make change, we became closer than ever. So to give you an example of one of the guys that, that's in the program who is doing exceptionally well now, our first time trying to engage him doing outreach took 60, 70 knocks at his door. It's hundreds of phone calls where he's ignoring us. He doesn't want to be part of change as he know as we know it at that time. But through being consistent, being relentless, the first couple times when we went to meet him, he said, yeah, y'all can come meet me. He sat down the street in a car and let us know we weren't police. Right, so that says a lot about where he's at in his life and being able to trust people and why he's always defensive thinking everybody's out to get him. First time we brought him to the building, he came to the building and he stood with his back against the wall where he could see everybody because he didn't trust his environment or his surroundings. All that to say that all these things that we went through with this guy but once he got it, that changes was necessary for him at that moment. He was successful in our transitional employment program. He went to NCIA. He did vehicles for change for a little while. And right now, at this moment, he's a used car salesman with his own cars. He doesn't work for anyone. He's a successful entrepreneur. He puts tents on windows sells his own vehicles, and even cleans his own vehicles. All that through time and a couple of years of understanding what CBT meant to him and what Roka meant to him, but more importantly, what he meant to himself. Because he wanted change, we were just that vehicle to support that change. So we talk about change again. We service 240 young men. Are all these young men going to get it today, tomorrow, the next day? Maybe not. But they'll definitely get it if they stay consistent and they mean what they say to themselves about acting on their values. Learning that change is possible and it starts with them. Some of y'all may never, ever see the inside of a Roka door under certain circumstances, right? And I kind of hope, I really hope y'all don't because that doesn't mean y'all made a wrong choice. But even if y'all chose to make that wrong choice, just understand that a change is possible and Roka is here to help support that change. So are there any questions about Roka, about Jamal, about myself, just in general? Was anything confusing? I don't know if you want to raise hands, what works the best? Yeah, So we have youth workers, right? That's our outreach staff. That's who Jamal oversees directly. And we have 10 of them. But what's interesting and different about ROCA and how we approach the work 
is the youth workers are kind of that frontline initial contact, but everybody does outreach, right? Everybody's going and knocking on doors because just because someone's youth worker has a relationship with a young person, it doesn't mean that that young person won't have a relationship with myself or Jamal or an educator. So everybody does outreach, but that team is, is 10 individuals under Jamal. Oh, hold on. So back in the front. So this is where outreach comes in that we get a referral and based on sometimes the information is great information, sometimes it's limited. So it's just all about using what you have and make what information you have and making the best out of it. Sometimes all you get is an address. The address may be good, it may not be good. Sometimes it takes for you in these neighborhoods, in these streets around people you don't know and don't know you to ask questions about who this young man may be. So it's all about the information we get from the beginning. So when we're talking about these young men or anybody who is at the center of urban violence, they're the ones in these communities that might be driving the crime, that might be the victims of crime. The reality you have to be willing to go to them. And that gets lost on a lot of programs is our young men aren't going to come to Roca every day with a smile on. We have to go engage them, build that relationship and trust Jamal was talking about. So they're willing to come be vulnerable in a safe place at Roca and start to work on that change process. So, you know, we're in Roca vehicles in these neighborhoods across the entire city. We're together, we're separate, and we're doing what we need to do to find, you know, these 240 young men on a daily basis. Roca started 34 years ago, really a long time ago. We started in a place called Chelsea, Massachusetts, which is a tiny little city next to Boston. And, um, Similarly, there were lots of things going on in the city of Chelsea, just like going on in, in Baltimore. There was a lot of violence. There were issues with the police department. There were issues with government. And we started there. And we just have an incredible team. And uh, some young people who grew up in the organization now work in the organization. So we've grown from there. So the most important thing is that CBT, that cognitive behavioral theory. And it's about that bottom brain thinking, right? You're in survival mode. And over time, when you learn and use these skills and understand that what you think, feel, and do are three separate things, but one will impact the other two, right? So if you think that your life is in jeopardy and you feel anxious and scared, you might pull a gun out, right? That's the reality for the young men. So really teaching them those skills over time is the most important thing. But then we have opportunities that bring CBT into real life. Jamal mentioned transitional employment. So a lot of our young men have never worked. They may have had a job and lost it. So we give them a safe place to use that CBT in a real life work setting. So they're coming in every morning at seven o'clock. They're going out with a crew supervisor and they're working with the Department of Parks and Rec, the Department of Public Works, general services, doing you know landscaping, construction, cleanup. But it's not about teaching them an advanced skill or a trade. It's about using CBT in real time when things get difficult, All right? So if you're, it gets hot in Baltimore in the summer, right? It's humid, it's 100 degrees. You didn't wanna show up to work in the first place. You're getting in an argument with your girlfriend. You're late on rent. You show up, you're hot, you're tired, you're hungry, and your crew supervisor asks you, hey, Kurt, can you go pick up that pile of trash over there? I might go back to survival mode. And you know what? I don't wanna pick up the trash. I'm gonna tell my crew supervisor to go wherever. I'm gonna throw the piece of equipment. I'm gonna walk off. Or you can take an end, eight to 10 second pause and use CBT and realize like I asked you all about work or excuse me, about education. Do I value this job? Is it important to me? And will my decision allow me to keep this job so that I can pay my rent? And I can continue that change process, right? CBT is in everything we do. And we also offer mental health counseling, education, so pre-GED, GED. We offer pre-vote classes to help young men learn skills in trades that they want. Jamal mentioned NCIA, which is a great partner in the city. They offer HVAC, automotive, um, CDL. CDL driver's culinary license, arts. culinary arts, all these things that once the young men learn how to use CBT, they can access those opportunities. So. And truth be told, if a young person asks us for something and we don't have it, we'll find out how to get it for them so that they can continue that process. 
Uh, we started in Chelsea, Massachusetts, which was a predominantly Latino community when we started. And Roca means rock in Spanish. And so we kind of wanted a name that sounded really strong. And as the organization's grown and we have young people from different places, we've held on to it. I will say that safety is at the forefront of what we do. And you, know, you heard what we were talking about, young people who might carry guns, they might have shot somebody, they might have been shot. Uh, but that doesn't stop us from doing the work. And really the, the core of it is how we collaborate with criminal justice partners. So you have to work with the police department. If you're gonna serve this group of individuals, you have to work very closely with the police department in the city that you're in because the information they can give us when we get a referral or if a neighborhood or a certain part of the city is unsafe, it helps Jamal, myself, guide the work. You know, if we know that there's been X amount of shootings or homicides in a part of Baltimore, we're not gonna send our staff there. And if we do, we're gonna be very careful about who goes, when they go, and what the approach is. So that is you know, at the forefront of what we're doing because if we can't keep our staff physically safe, we cannot engage these young people and have them trust us enough to feel that they're safe when they're with us. And that's important because everything that we do is based on that trust we built with a young person. The second we don't do something we say we're going to do or they feel like we've put them in an unsafe situation, they have no reason to be with us anymore. They have no reason to trust us. So similarly, similarly to how we work with the police department, we work very closely with parole and probation and the Department of Juvenile Services. And that partnership has grown over the past three and a half years to where we are communicating constantly about the young person and we're updating them on their participation in ROCA. So we'll get an email and say, how is Kurt doing? You know, what programming is he participating in? Is he on the work crew? Or Kurt has a court date coming up. Can someone from ROCA come and speak on his behalf, give us an update for the judge, so on and so forth. And I will say that, you know, that communication is critical because we can drive our own intentional conversations with young people if they're not doing what they need to be doing for probation or, or juvenile supervision, because that's important, right? If you want to make behavior change and get to a point where you're out of harm's way and you're no longer connected to these systems, you actually have to go see your probation officer. You have to go to court. And those things might be uncomfortable, but that's CBT. Is when you feel uncomfortable and you think, you know, I haven't seen my probation officer in six months. If I go there, they're gonna lock me up and you avoid going, that cycle is just gonna continue, right? So using CBT to have them understand, yes, it's uncomfortable, but we'll go with you and you'll have the conversation and then we'll work on what the next steps are. Too, with probation and juvenile services, their job is sort of compliance. If you get in trouble, you have to do certain things. And those probation officers or juvenile justice case managers are trying to make sure you do those certain things. But working with them keeps them safe. So I know that you're looking at social justice. I know you're, you're looking at racial justice and what your role is and how you understand and bring change. So on the individual level, these are a group of young people who are kind of left out of the discussions, that people really aren't thinking about what has to change for them. You also, I probably have learned about systems. What do big systems do that perpetuate racism? So another piece that's very exciting in Baltimore so a little bit different here, is that our work with probation and juvenile justice is bringing big systems change. So juvenile justice is now asking ROCA to train all their staff in our CBT because they have figured out that is more helpful for young people and to get them to change as a system how they act. Also with probation, what used to happen you get in trouble. They tell you to go do anywhere from five, six, seven things. They don't really help you get to the place to do those things. They don't really help you figure out how to do it. And then if you get in trouble, they lock you up. So what probation has started to do is change how they operate based on our relationship with them and understanding the brain. And they too are gonna help young people use CBT so we can work together so young people can stay alive and stay out of prison. So just to tie it in a little bit in your great efforts around social justice and racial justice.